Well, as always, uh, when I follow or uh, talk about this topic with Ted, um, he and I are actually very similarly aligned in that I think we both agree that there are some aneurysms that are better left clipped and there are some aneurysms that are better, better left coiled. Um, and so I really agree with that. I think also uh, the cases that he showed were very choice and good examples of uh, cases that, typically speaking, um, really represent very good coil examples. But in literature, uh, specifically medical literature, our job isn't to necessarily look at, a, look at a case here or look at a case there or look at a case here. It's rather to establish true trends in the medical research and to really understand why we're getting those results. Let's get into some of the data and, and see if we can really understand this. We talked about this a second ago. Is it clip? Is it coil? Well, sometimes it's both, sometimes it's, it's neither. Both Ted and I believe in kind of a multidisciplinary approach to this, okay? Oil and water is, is, is a little harsh. I think it's more like bread and butter. Um, let's actually start. I've got a couple of kind of primer questions. We're going to do a few questions to start with this time. And then we'll, finish, we'll do three questions to start with, and then we'll finish with two questions, okay? Can you switch over to the questions, or did you already? Yeah. Great. Okay. So, first of all, a general question. Is, tech, is newer technology always better? Yes. <laughs> so, the answer is yes or no. All right. So that's a probably a, uh, that's probably a little bit more extreme than what I thought. But anyway, I, I kind of agree. It's not necessarily better, although sometimes it really is. We see a lot of technology that comes through in the spine industry that stinks. Sometimes it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Here's a scenario, and, and I understand that many folks won't necessarily appreciate on how to treat this, but by the end of our lecture, uh, after Dr. Larson's lecture, and hopefully after mine, you'll be able to have a better sense of this. A 55-year-old patient with a ruptured 7-millimeter middle cerebral aneurysm um, is evaluated. Which do you think is the best management? Treat with endovascular coiling? Treat with surgical clipping? No treatment is necessary. That I like you guys. Third question. If you were the one with a ruptured aneurysm, how important is it, and this is, a, this is really the, one of the fundamental questions, how important is it that you have a permanent cure? Is it very important? Somewhat important? Not so important, you just want to get through the first crisis, or whatever is easiest. Okay. I, I think I would generally agree with that, too. Um, so let's, let, let, let's dive into this debate. Um, I, I do want to apologize. There's a lot of data here. I'm going to try to summarize every couple of slides what we just talked about. Um, and, um, uh, and remember, after this, we do the drawing for the gifts, or for the, uh, for this, uh, for the prizes. Um, first of all, is coiling superior? I mean, that's really the question at hand here. We've got, a, we've got if you will, the, the, the gold standard of, of surgical clip ligation for ruptured aneurysms. Well, there are three prospective randomized trials. What does prospective randomized trials mean? That means it's the best data that we can get. All right. Now, that's not necessarily always the best data, but in this case, it's the best data that we can uh, derive. And there are the studies that Dr. Uh, Larson uh, already discussed. And then we're going to talk about some of the concerns regarding the studies. Patient selection, durability, re-bleeding. And then treatment morbidity and mortality. And my, my pitch to you is that, in fact, we're going we're gonna to see some significant changes. When Ted presented, he was very accurate with his presentation. He, he just didn't give you the whole picture. ISAP did, show, did coil, uh, favor coiling at one year, but not at five years. At five years, it was analogous to, to clip ligation. We're just going to call it clipping from now on. In the, BRAT, in the BRAT trial, it favored coiling at one year, but not at three years. In the finished study, which is the third study of that, of that trial that he talked about, there was no difference at one year. So let's get into a little bit more detail on this. And I, you're, it's, it, it is a little, bit, it's a little bit murky, and I think Ted's right about that. Um, the BRAD intent, which was the uh, barrel ruptured aneurysm trial, uh, was to compare the safety and the efficacy of clipping versus coiling and determine whether or not patients, uh, and, and basically they enrolled everyone. And this is the real difference between BRAT versus ISAT. ISAT which really changed how we practiced uh, uh, treating aneurysms, only included um, a very small percentage of the patients they enrolled. In fact, a vast majority of the patients that they could have included, they chose not to. 
They just they, they went ahead and treated them outside the study. And so if you want to talk about flawed data, the flawed data in this data set unfortunately represents ISAT, not BRAT. The hypothesis of this study was that no difference existed with regard to clipping versus coiling. Uh, they measured uh, outcomes at discharge, six months, one, three, six, and, and soon to be 10 years. Uh, and then imaging uh, at the time of treatment, three, six, and 10 years as well. Um, the methods were uh, fairly straightforward in terms of they looked at the specific outcomes. The MRS is the modified Rankin uh, score. And uh, basically, if it's two or greater, you're, you're, you're dependent on, on somebody to help do things. Uh, and so that's an important variable. If you can get around, but you're hobbling a little bit, um, then, uh, then we, you know, for this bad disease, we consider that, consider that to be okay. Everyone agrees on that. That's not a, that's not a me pitching that. That's, that's a fairly commonly accepted uh, baseline. And the sentinel events they also looked at were repeat bleeding, retreatments, and death. This is a large study, 470 patients. Uh, 238 of them were uh, randomized to clipping. 232 of them were randomized to coiling. Uh, there is a crossover issue that I will that I will discuss in just a second. As a result, 280 were actually clipped, and 128 were actually coiled. That's okay that we get some uh, more clip data. We're actually we're, we're we're starved for clip data these days. We have plenty of coiled data, so that actually turns out to be okay. Well, I think the key the key here is that as as we talked about a moment ago, that and, and I think Ted uh, accurately uh, accurately pointed out that at the one year mark. There was a statistical difference uh, between clipping and coiling that, that was positive. In other words, this, this favored coiling at one year. But then at three years, and at three years carried forward, which means all the patients that we lost, uh, on both of those, we lost our statistical significance, telling us very clearly that there is no statistical difference from three years and three years forward with clipping versus coiling. How could that be? Well, having, your, having the aneurysm that rupture is a little bit like getting hit by a car. It's a big deal. You're not necessarily improved or, or better um, uh, after a year, and it just takes a while. And those of us that have had family, friends, or patients that have had this problem can appreciate that. And so we're really understanding a little bit more about the natural history when we say that. Um, and so the conclusion was that, in this, in this little mini-segment, is that the BRAT data showed no difference after one year. Okay, and that's pretty important. So, but it does, it does beg the question, if both methods work, why not just coil everything? It's less, uh, it's less invasive, it's sexier. We'd heard that it's, it's cheaper, it's newer, it's kind of cool. And so I think those are some good points and we're gonna to try to address some of those next. Now let's talk about aneurysm obliteration. This is really a key thing. And again, I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to negate the earlier statistics in terms of the earlier time courses, but let's really fast forward this to three years and, and on because at the end of the day, we want our patients to live longer than a year, which is why we really want to present data that has as long of a time follow-up as possible. That represents more accurate data. The longer we go, the more accurate the data becomes. And sure enough, at three years, um, complete obliteration was only, uh, was only about half of the coiled patients, whereas 87% of those patients uh, that were clipped had, 87% uh, uh, of patients who were clipped had, had aneurysm obliteration. That's a pretty a profound difference. Retreatments are also very important. After six months, there were no more retreatments uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the coil group, okay? Excuse me, in the clip group. Whereas in the coil group, you continue to have events that would require retreatment, all right? And um, so that really, that really funnels out to be about 13% of patients who were coiled had to have a retreatment versus 4% of patients who had clipping. That's a, 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 a significant difference, okay? So concluding that, both the data are equivalent with regards to outcome that we've just talked about from three years and three years on. Uh, we're going to talk more about that, and I'll give you some granularity and some honesty there too. Uh, but clipping clearly has a higher obliteration rate and a lower retreatment rate. So if both treatments are equivalent, but we have a long-term success towards clipping, you can see the pendulum, or what's that thing called? The No, the, the what is it? A trebuchet? I've learned so much from you, Ted. The trebuchet maybe is, is turning a little bit more towards the clipping. Well, let's add a little bit of granularity. Let, we really need to look at aneurysm distribution because if we're going to compare ISAT data, which is what we're going to talk about next, we really need to tease out the anterior circulation aneurysms and the posterior circulation aneurysms. They are two completely different beasts. And I'm going to start off by saying right away that posterior circulation aneurysms 
If we can safely uncoil them well, I, I really do believe that we should try that first. However, they only represent a pretty small percentage of that. In fact, 83% of patients in the BRAT data set and more like 90% of patients across the board represent anterior circulation aneurysms, okay? Posterior circulation aneurysms in the BRAT, in the BRAT study uh, were 17%, but as I said, more typically represent about 10%, okay? And I think it's also very important to note that in the BRAT, in the BRAT data set, we have in the posterior circulation, because of the wonders of randomization, on has patients three, four, and five, 71 percent, almost uh, almost three quarters of patients were high, what we call high grade subarachnoid hemorrhages. Whereas compared to the wonders of randomization, which sometimes occurs, 58 percent of the patients uh, in the coiling group, which means that the patients that were clipped were a much sicker set of patients. We also know that uh, if we look at a multivariate analysis of of a number of different factors, we find that the Hunt Hess scale uh, here is the most uh, sensitive predictor of overall outcomes. So we've got a group of patients who've been randomized to the posterior fossa um, for clipping, who are also, in this case, also the sickest. And, and these patients do the worst, okay? So what does that mean? Well, bear with me. So when we look at the overall assigned treatment groups for the posterior circulation aneurysms, it strongly favors coiling, as I said. The big problem here is our randomization truly failed. And so we actually don't have a good data set on this. Um, all of these bars, whether it's clip or coil, um, um, uh, blue or, or pumpkin colored, um, should, should be about the same. And as you can see here, we actually don't, we don't make up data. We actually, we actually truly randomize these patients. And as it happened, this randomization, we basically flipped a coin 20, uh, 20 times and 17 times it turned up to be heads. And so as a result, our, our posterior circulation data in the BRAT is, is indeed uh, fairly challenging. And, and so if you look at, if we look specifically, and sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. Those are specifically pica aneurysms. Pica aneurysms, as cerebral vascular uh, specialists will agree on, have a horrible natural history when they rupture. They're difficult to get at, they're difficult to treat, they've got lots of complications here and there. And so we've just got the bad luck of having the BRAT data, um, which I've already told you at the beginning, we've already proven that after three years we're analogous. So we've got this big red herring, and even with this big red herring, we're still, we're still equivalent at three years, okay? So where are we going with this? Uh-oh. There we go. Um, Basically, we had a pica non-randomization event in the, in, the, in the BRAT trial. And if we look at pica aneurysms versus all other, other non-pica posterior uh, fossa aneurysms, they all do much crappier, okay? And pretty good, pretty good p-values to say, yeah, that's right. So what are we really saying with that bunch of razzmatazz? Well, being super honest with you and saying, first of all, that in the BRAT study, posterior circulation aneurysms did better with coiling, okay? That represents typically about 10% of patients and BRAT about 17% of patients. Um, I will note though that the randomization really failed here. And so I'm not really sure we know what to do with this data at this point. Um, is it really fair to attribute this data set to our conclusions? Well, we've already included it and I've already told you that even with the inclusion of that, the uh, BRAT and uh, BRAT has shown us that coiling and clipping are analogous, okay? Compare and contrast the posterior circulation aneurysms, the nasty ones back here, with the sometimes nasty but a little bit more straightforward anterior circulation aneurysms. The randomization works beautifully here. See how analogous these are? And again, this is flipping of a coin. We just got lucky. All right. And sure enough, when we look at when we look at the results of that, we see very clearly here that the p-values uh, say to us that the modified Rankin scales are, are analogous, and therefore coiling and clipping are very similar. All right. So can, what do we, can, can we conclude, conclude with that? Intercirculation aneurysms can be treated uh, equally with clip versus coil. Poster circulation aneurysms may or may not favor coil. We, we just don't, don't know, actually. We don't actually have good data on that. So that's the BRAT study, okay? And that's, many of us think that that's probably the best study out there because it, they included everyone. Uh, they were very skilled uh, surgeons versus endovascular therapists. It was really a nice, an, a nice analogous group. Um, let's look at ISAT. ISAT really was a game changer. Is that a fair, fair comment, Ted? And uh, again, what I really want to do is let's look at the, the longest out data set that we can get. Let's not look at one year. Let's not look at six months. Let's look at the reality, which is 
life moving forward. And sure enough, as we look at this, um, we can see a, a couple of things. Um, the initial report, as, as Ted said, was quite accurate uh, in that the results strongly favored coiling. However, the five year, uh, what we see is the results are actually very clear. Also notice, look at how poorly these people are doing, only 30 or 23% of patients are doing well, whereas at five years, 82, 83% of the patients are doing really well. So healing does happen. That's what's the nice thing about dealing with humans, and that's why I think we all like to do that. Um, so what does that mean? Well, first of all, it takes a while to recover from these things, whether it's coil or whether it's clipping, and that we know that these are, these are not significant. There's no, there's no statistical difference between these data sets. So, but let, let's talk about this, because Ted brought up an interesting point, and it's just inter it's interesting. We didn't actually exchange slide sets beforehand, but we talk about a lot of the same things. My <laughs> points are right, his points aren't as right. The, um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, but Broderick, uh, who is, is a well-respected uh, guy in stroke, basically said that, you know what, though? Even though the results at five years are analogous, because there was a higher death rate, and which is of statistical significance, you know what? Coiling should still be favored. And I think he even said something along those lines, too. Well, I think that the key thing here is, again, we have to understand what the data really means. Where is the data truly coming from? If we look at ISAT, there's a huge problem with how, there are many problems with how the, conducted, the study was conducted. I'm not saying that because it didn't give me the results that I wanted. I'm saying that because I, I like to understand where the data is coming from. And sure enough, as we look at something that's very important here, uh, in the pre-treatment group, 17 patients in the endovascular group had a re-hemorrhage, seven of which died. In the clipping group, 28 patients had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and 19 died in the surgical group. So before the race had even started, but before any opportunity to treat the patient had occurred, these patients re-bled and or died. And that's a huge problem, right? Because it's hard to analyze data if, 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 you, if, you, can't, if, if you don't even have patients to begin with. And sure enough, as we look at that, um, in, the, um, in the endovascular group, 1.1 days until treatment occurred after hemorrhage, whereas in the clipping group, 1.7 days occurred. That's a 14-hour delay in a disease where the first 24 hours is everything with regard to treating the problem. And if you're not treating this bleeding or potentially re-rupturing aneurysm, you're going to skew the data, okay? And so when the pre team uh, mortality is excluded, which is a perfectly reasonable, reasonable statistical assumption to do, but there's actually no significant difference. And I think that's a very important thing to say about a very important study. Okay? And that really brings us to this point, is that it was a really, equal, was a really analogous or equal commitment. Uh, is that a present for me? Yeah. Oh, great. Um, was there equal commitment in the, in the clipping arm versus the coiling arm with ISAT? And the answer is, I don't know. But a very important thing comes up with that piece of data. What if, that's a matter of routine, what if it takes longer to clip a patient than to coil a patient? Then we do have to include that in our natural history, right? If it takes two weeks to coil a, uh, or to clip a patient and you can coil a patient in a day, well then we do have to include that, right? So, timing of treatment, let's talk briefly about that. In ISAT, as I said, 1.1 days for coiling, 1.7 days for clipping. In BRAT, there was no difference in time and no difference in the treatment morbidity or mortality. That makes to me a little bit more sense, right? You would imagine a certain number of patients are going to bleed, but if we keep them analogous, whether it's at a day or two days or three days, that's fine, right? So in actual practice, published by a fairly large um, uh, review from uh, O'Kelly, uh, coiling on a national, national review takes about two and a half days, clipping takes about two days. So in actual practice, we're actually clipping patients a little bit more quickly than we're coiling patients. So I think we can very safely assume that we can take out that pretreatment uh, mortality. Interestingly enough, in ISAT, they started off at 1.1 days for coiling, and by the end, at the end of the enrollment, it actually had, had drifted to 2.3 days. So in fact, it really had come closer to this actual practice data, which makes sense, all right? So, Key slide. At the end of the day, what does that really mean? Well, if we can if we can pull out that pretreatment morbidity from ISAT, and let's just jump through these numbers here. I, I try to be as complete as possible with this data, but I realize it's a lot of data. Um, 
we look now at nine years later. 45, 45 patients in the endovascular group had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, 22 died. Whereas in the clipping group, 18 patients had a subarachnoid re-hemorrhage and 11 died. So that really breaks down to risk of re-bleeding is two and a half times higher with coiling than with clipping, albeit, as Ted said, it's a small number. But this is a real number, okay? And the risk of death is about two times higher uh, after coiling versus clipping, all right? And so I think that's a very important point, and we're going to bring that up again. Let's talk a little bit about re-bleeding, sorry. Um, every study that we've done on this has shown a higher risk of re-bleeding with coiling as opposed to clipping, all right? There's a non-significant risk of bleeding from the treated aneurysm in the endovascular cohort uh, by what they call intention to treat, but a significant difference in the ISAT group when the analysis was actual treatment, okay? So even ISAT is saying, yeah, it's more likely to bleed. In ISAT, there was a 17% recurrence, okay? Of those, interestingly, 54% were clipped, 46% were coiled. Every study has demonstrated a higher risk of re-bleeding when coiling as opposed to clipping, as I said. Oops, that's a duplicative slide. So, what does that really mean? Well, these are, these are happening earlier in time, but sure enough, as we look at, as we look at coiling versus clipping, the re-bleeding rate is clearly higher. So, what can we conclude about that little chunk of data? Well, the standard practice, which wasn't reflected in ISAT, uh, is that coiling and clipping are similar from a time to treatment. In other words, however, however long the patient bleeds until they get treated, it's similar, all right? That's not reflected in ISAT. If we pull that data out, the results are actually analogous, okay? Now, a, a lot of naysayers will say, we can't pull that data out. Well, we can pull data out if, if it's a reasonable assumption uh, as to why we're pulling it out. We can't magically, statistically smoke and mirror stuff but I explained to you exactly why that's a reasonable premise to do, why we have good data to do that. So let's talk about how effective, uh, or how protective coiling is, and how durable the endovascular construct is. One of the questions we actually asked in the beginning is how important is it to treat the problem? You know, if you've got the Titanic, only you fix the problem, and then all of a sudden, uh, the next night on the Titanic voyage, the ship starts sinking again. I mean, you know, don't we want to just get on with our lives a little bit instead of turning it into a chronic disease a little bit? That's what I always say to Ted. So I think that's a very, very, a very, um, a very important point. This is a bad subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, uh, after, uh, uh, or a subarachnoid hemorrhage that's treated with coiling and has had a recurrence. Um, so there's a very interesting study here published in 2013 this year, uh, which looks at a very large cohort of, of aneurysms, uh, almost 1,600 uh, over 18 years, um, and it looked at uh, a follow-up of about. Um, 18 months, which isn't a great follow-up. You know, as, as I've been trying to pitch here, I think the longer follow-up we have on these, the better off we're going to really understand what happens here. Uh, interestingly, though, 22% demonstrated a significant regrowth. Um, and importantly, the um, as, as we look, as we uh, wade down through the data here, we also remember that in the ISAT data, 70% recurrence of cold aneurysms, so whether it's 17% or 22%, that's a lot of stuff going on. 46% uh, of those were, 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 were had to be recoiled. The BRAT treatment, uh, they had a little bit of better success, uh, but they're still recoiling 13% of their aneurysms. Five-year recurrence rate, 21% um, on the coil rate. So again, the farther we get out, the less appealing endovascular therapy seems to, uh, uh, seems to help us. So the conclusion, which I think is a reasonable conclusion, is that recurrence and re-bleeding remain a major concern uh, with endovascular coiling. Sorry. So let's talk a little bit about bleeding after after incomplete coiling. Um, so Dr. Leshin showed a nice example of an NCA that had a small a small little uh, uh, cleft left, and it was a necessary cleft because of the configuration of the aneurysm. Had he tried to do a complete coiling. Uh, then indeed he uh, would have probably occluded that outgoing vessel. So sometimes we have to accept a suboptimal solution for a bad problem. All right. So no criticism there. But let's talk about some actual data here. And I think this is this really brings it to home. So bleeding after uh, at, in the ISAT study was about one percent per year. It's a pretty small number. Okay, one percent. That means ninety-nine percent of patients do well. 
but that is per year, so it does it does it is cumulative over time. Uh, we've got a couple of other studies uh, that are about a, uh, that are similar uh, as similar numbers. Now, again, these aren't retrospective, uh, but uh, sorry, these are retrospective, not prospective. But for whatever it's worth, I think it's I think it's reasonable. Here's the catch on this, though. The natural history of an unruptured aneurysm that hasn't bled is about one percent per year. Okay, and so if Incomplete coiling hasn't really changed the natural history. Then is it really, should we even be trying to incompletely coil anything? Should we even be trying to treat that at all? And I think that's, I think that's a valid, I think that's a, a valid, a valid comment. So let's get back to um, some of the uh, protection and recurrence uh, in the ISUIA data, which is, a, which is kind of a fundamental workhorse data set uh, that um, was published uh, about 10 years ago now. Um, and we found that there were 81 deaths um, uh, due to subarachnoid hemorrhage after, out of a very large cohort of patients, okay? Three and a half percent were just from just observation, just following uh, uh, three and a half percent of patients who were followed had a hemorrhage. In the data set where the, they were coiled, almost three percent of the coiling group whereas half a percent of the clipping group, which certainly suggests to me that although the rehemorrhage rate is very infrequent, it's certainly better from in a, in a clipping context than in a coiling context, all right? And specifically, risk of death from a rebleed is about six times higher for coiling uh, than for clipping. Recurrence of a completely coiled aneurysm is approximately 17% at one year. Okay, and we've we've said that for, for, through a lot of different data channels that it's about 17%. Call it 20%. Call it 15%. It's a number, one in five. Recurrences of clipped aneurysms, a quarter to a half percent. All right, so our recurrence rate is significantly less. So if we're not altering the natural history of the disease, and we're not really treating the disease, is what I would pitch back to you guys. Uh, the ISAT data clearly shows that if we have approximately one percent rebleed re rate per year. We haven't really accomplished anything. Now we probably have, but we don't really know what we've accomplished. Comparing a contrasting clipping with coiling, where there's a, a quarter to a half percent rebleed rate per year, we probably have accomplished something because that's less than the natural history of the disease. Okay? So, you know, Dr. Larson did I think a great job of showing some of the amazing advances we have. Uh, not only can we endovascularly uh, coil these, we also have a flow diversion technology and, and, and stent uh, and stent technology as well. Does anyone need a coffee bean? <laughs> We're getting close to being, being done and winning this battle. <laughs> so what does that really mean? Well, balloon-assisted coiling, stenting, Y stents, and there's a lot of different things that are out there, all right? So let's look at an, at an interesting study by, uh, that was published in Stroke in 2010. And this looked at uh, uh, coiling versus stent-assisted coiling. As Dr. Larson uh, was going through, sometimes we can just put coils into aneurysms and occlude them like that. Sometimes we actually have to prevent the coils from flopping back down into the vessel, so we put a little stent there to hold the coils up in their place. Okay, uh, so coiling versus stent-assisted coiling here and here, and indeed uh, they weren't entirely analogous studies. And for whatever it's worth, I'll say that in the coiling versus the stent-assisted coiling, there's a larger proportion of patients who had subarachnoid hemorrhage in the coiling population as a versus the stent and the coiling, which we would expect. We try to avoid using stents in those. And in fact, um, it worked for the most part. Uh, but the problem was that we had a fairly high paraprocedural mortality, excuse me, morbidity and mortality associated with the stents. And the conclusion that he drew uh, with that stenting decreases recurrences, which is true, uh, but increases the morbidity and mortality associated with treating these lesions. This is already a pretty morbid disease. We're trying to minimize that in as much as reasonably possible. So in that same, in that same uh, issue, the, we, they went ahead and did an, an editorial. Um, and again, this is from a stroke neurologist who basically said, no cumulative risk of an unruptured aneurysm uh, that can outweigh this heightened complication rate, which I think is a fairly reasonable comment, um, maybe a little extreme. This is a very interesting paper uh, by Huang, uh, who basically looked at uh, coiling versus stent-assisted coiling uh, and basically did analogous side-by-side -side match controls. And what they found is that there was actually no real difference in recanalization of the aneurysm um, at, at, at the two-year follow-up, which means that it works, but you probably don't even need to use stents. Um, 
and then a, a further editorial article in uh, Journal of Neuroradiology, which Dr. Larson, uh, I'm sure, gets, uh, says there's no credible data to support the use of sentences to uh, coiling for aneurysms. Again, these are a little bit like pulling data out of, out of thin air. But I guess my, my point here is that the trends, I think, are important. What about flow, di flow diverter technologies? Well, flow diverter technologies are amazing things. We saw that beautiful uh, cavernous carotid aneurysm for which there are no surgical solutions, and it fixed the problem. It was great. Um, I think that the key thing on these is that we've learned is that we really need to be very careful about who we're using these in. Uh, they are not the catch-all, fix-all solutions for nasty, proximal ICA aneurysms. I think Ted and I both agree they're very effective. But this isn't the fix-all, all right? Um, I'm going to jump past this to go to this. Um, I think it's important, and we're, we're almost done here. This is an excellent paper by O'Kelly. Basically, it said uh, that, and I'm just going to read it, to determine from a retrospective analysis a cohort of adult aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients undergoing aneurysm treatment uh, for about a decade in Canada, whether or not uh, the occlusion of the ruptured aneurysm represents a reduced hazard. And what they found, interestingly enough, and again, this is not prospective randomized, but it's not a bad study, and it's from a good data set, and it's a very large study. Uh, they looked at uh, 700 uh, coiled, uh, 2300 clipped, and they basically said here that the mortality of clipping was about 25% uh, and coiling 27%. But with that huge number, that actually was highly statistically significant. <laughs> Your admission rate for subarachnoid hemorrhage, clipping 1.8, that's, that's pretty high. Coiling 3.0, also much higher than we've seen. So both of these are high, but also not quite statistically significant. But whether it's mortality or readmission, we're basically saying not all the studies say that coiling is better. Okay? Almost done. I sat in BRAC comparison, because that's really the, 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 the truth here. I sat excluded 77% of the eligible patients. 97% of these patients were anti-circulation aneurysms. What does that mean? They cherry picked. 88% were low grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. What does that mean? They cherry picked. 50% of aneurysms were less than 5 millimeters. 90% of aneurysms were less than 10. That's a, that's a very impressive small, uh, it's very impressive in terms of being able to find small aneurysms. That kind of means they did it, they, they cherry picked as well. Not as badly as that. The benefit was at one year, not five years, okay? But what does this mean? We have changed our practices because of this flawed data, partly because the initial results were so compelling, as Dr. Larson said, they even stopped the study early. But what we found is, We've actually followed these patients out. The data wasn't as compelling as we thought. In the United Kingdom, clipping decreased from 50% to 30%. Coiling increased from 35% to almost 70%. Okay? In the United States, coiling increased from 17% to 58%. Wow. Uh, coiling increased from 30% to 63% for unruptured aneurysm. So a significant increase, and we're making a lot of people really rich. But is it the right thing? I don't know. Um, so for anterior circulation aneurysms, what would you choose? Coiling versus clipping. Equal time to treatment risk. In other words, we, we, can, we, can, we can get these things treated. We've shown in breath that, they, that we can safely treat both of these groups. Coiling, we have a 48% obliteration rate at six years, 96% obliteration at six years um, in the clipping group. 13% of patients will be retreated in the coiling group, whereas 4% will be treated, uh, retreated in, in six years. Two and a half times higher re-bleed rate for coiling. Two and a half times to six uh, times lo lower re-bleed lower re rate for, for clipping. We can treat um, almost 60% of patients with coiling. We can treat almost 100% of patients with clipping. So, my conclusions and thoughts. I think there's really absence of conclusive data to determine the superiority of one treatment uh, over another. I think applying the results of a, of a very selective cohort of, uh, of data, uh, in this case ISAT, uh, to, aneurysm pa to all aneurysm patients is just not appropriate. Uh, in BRAT, 38% of patients uh, were crossed over in one arm, 42% uh, 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 for, um, uh, for anterior circulation. There's no significant difference to, to answer your circulation aneurysms at this time. We don't, the, the study's not done yet. Risk of re-bleeding and retreatment and obliteration certainly favor clipping. A strong case can be made that anterior circulation aneurysms should be considered for clipping. Probably not posterior circulation aneurysms unless we don't have a complete treatment option. 
If we half ass treat a posterior circulation aneurysm, then we should probably consider treating that surgically. Picking which treatment is certainly an art. It's, there's no science, okay? Well, there is some science. We presented it. Uh, but there's certainly, there, there's certainly no uh, solid thing. And I think very importantly, multimodality um, uh, treatment regime is, is very important, okay? Um, I, I wanted, before we jump into the, to the last two questions that I have, um, I wanted to address a couple of things that I hadn't had in my presentation that uh, Ted had in his pumpkin talk. The um, uh, vasospasm in, in clip versus, he, he commented that there's a higher rate of vasospasm in clip versus coil. And, and that's probably true. Um, and the reason for that is, is fairly challenging. Some of this has to do with retractor injury, and some of this is, is an unknown factor. There are some studies that show that actually it's lower because you can evacuate the blood around the vessels, which can decrease your, your, your vasospasm risk. The other potential that we've seen is that it's very difficult to tell what's vasospasm versus uh, what's, uh, what's the retractor injury. We are getting a little better at that, and actually we're using going to retractorless surgery, which is uh, resolving that to some extent. Um, cognitive, cognitive, uh, cognitive decline, me too. Uh, in ISAT uh, is, is, is certainly something that's there. I think the challenge is, is that we actually haven't gone back and gone that, done that late data set with that. I will also tell you that if we're looking at ISAT in particular, we're looking at a cherry-picked group of patients um, with dedicated endovascular therapists and uh, a, a real criticism, respectfully, of some marginal uh, cerebral vascular surgeons. Um, and I will also say that we really have very little data on unruptured cerebral aneurysms, okay? Very little prospective data on unruptured cerebral aneurysms. The ISUIA data, which is, we both talked about, is the best data set we have for that. But it's, it's, it's really, it's not great data, and, and that was at least now t uh, 13 years old, the original one. Uh, so there's a lot more work that we have to do on that. So two questions, if we can go over to the questions, please. Uh, in a 55-year-old patient with a ruptured 7 millimeter aneurysm that was evaluated, what do you think is the best management? This is the same question we had earlier. <laughs> you can good. I'm going to go up a beer. <laughs> I think, very importantly, uh, <laughs> who do you think gave the most compelling argument today? Now, you can factor into this a couple of things. Looks, charm, wit. Um, Dr. Larson? Pumpkins. Yeah, pumpkins. The uh, Dr. Larson, or, or myself, neither, or, or perhaps both? <laughs> You're buying the first drink. Why don't you come on up here? <laughs> this is just the two of us. So, uh, and first of all, I'll, I'll offer you the opportunity to have a rebuttal. Um, the first thing that I want to point out is in the BRAT study, 38% of patients who were assigned to coiling crossed over to clipping. But the analysis of BRAT was based on primary intention to treat. So what that means is that the 38% who crossed over and got clipped were included in the outcomes for the coiling group. So that spoils the good results of the endovascular group. However, the reason they crossed over wasn't a matter of convenience. The reason they crossed over from the coil group to the clip group was because they had large hemorrhages or hematomas that needed to be evacuated. We know statistically speaking and historically speaking, those patients do really poorly. And so if they are included in the coiling group, that in theory would drag their number down. But as it, as it, as it stands, it didn't. They still have good data. My answer to that is I, I believe that they crossed over because that's where Dr. Spetzler practices. <laughs> I've been to the barrel a lot of times, and Dr. Spetzler and I are collegial uh, friends. And I will tell you that um, 
he, he really does believe in surgical cliff ligation is the right thing for some patients. But I will also tell you um, that the reason that he was the author in the second study and Cameron McDougall was the author in the first study was because the results had shifted. Cameron was still on Cameron was still on the second paper and Spetzler was still on the first paper. So it wasn't there wasn't a conspiracy there as Dr. Larson might have you believe. Um, any other a rebuttal comments besides that? As I mentioned uh, initially, my disclaimer is that I really believe that some aneurysms are better treated with clipping. That being said, and I go over this extensively with the patients that I counsel, I think it's pretty clear cut from the literature that there's a trade-off, and it's a classic trade-off. And the trade-off is, is that you are more likely to have a higher morbidity and mortality if you have the aneurysm clipped versus coiled. But you're more likely to have the aneurysm retreated if it's coiled than clipped. Now the other thing that I want to add, so you can just factor this in, the ISAT study was done in 2002. And that technology involved bare platinum GDC coils. First generation coils. A lot of things have changed in the interval. We have lots of different coils now. We have coils that have coatings on them that uh, incite the biologic response. Sometimes the polymer is on the inside of the coil. Sometimes it's filaments on the coil. We have coils that have gel that swells. We have uh, flow diverters I showed. We have vascular reconstruction devices. The paper by Moray uh, just this year, uh, there's a paper from Philadelphia that came out. It, I think it's very obvious that if you can have your complication rate low using VRDs or stents, that the aneurysm recurrence rate is less. And the paper from Philadelphia said that their complication rate was equal to only coiling aneurysms. We have balloon assistance. We have even, we haven't even talked about this, we have Onyx 500 which is a liquid embolic that we can use to treat aneurysms. I, in my own practice, I'm seeing the retreatment rate dramatically go down because of better technology. And, and I would actually echo that. I think that with the advent of new technology, we will have improvements and we will continue to have decreased morbidity and, uh, and, a, and a better treatment success. I just don't think we're there yet. Sure. Any questions? Thank you, Ted. Yeah, let, me, let me just add one other thing to, to take home with you. And, and this is what I tell my patients when I counsel them because you're getting more expert. Surgical clipping is always an option. But I, I just want to tell you, in the pa at least the patient population that I see, I'm very upfront with them. And I say, would you want to have your aneurysm clipped and have a higher risk of having a neurological complication? Or would you want to have it coiled with a lower risk of a neurological complication, but you're going to have to have it followed and retreated? And I will just tell you that the overwhelming majority of the patients that I see, you know what they pick. And ask yourself that leaving here. What would you pick? Okay, but may I respond to that? Sorry. The, um, at, at the end of the day, though, we're looking at the data. And, and the data is very clear and Brett that favors, excuse me, doesn't favor, it shows that the, that the neurological complications are analogous for ruptured aneurysms. We don't even have good data on unruptured aneurysms, and that's an entirely different conversation that maybe we'll do next year, uh, is looking and comparing and contrasting unruptured aneurysms. Because we're trying to pull a lot of data from ruptured aneurysms, and it's like, it's like, it's like dealing with a cat versus dealing with a tiger. And so the, the data is very different. But I think you, as, as always, make a good point. So one, one question from the audience. Is it on? Yeah. Are either of you participating in a pumpkin throwing contest? <laughs> I forgot to disclose that. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. We can have more questions. There's, we have time. Yeah, there's a few down All right. We're actually uh, two, I, two minutes ahead. Great. We're two minutes ahead. First time ever. Two questions over here. What does the coil actually look like? Because the picture show looks like a, a crow's nest. Is it's a it mess. actually like a coil? So let me tell you a little bit about the history of coiling. Uh, this was invented by an Italian neurosurgeon 
named uh, Guido Guglielmi, and that's why they're called GDC coils. Guglielmi detachable coils. And his father had a ruptured cerebral aneurysm, and he decided that he was going to attack this from a different perspective than clipping. So his initial intent was to put a coil into the aneurysm, deliver an electric charge to it, which, prom which promotes thrombosis, thrombose the aneurysm, and it would be done. And it turns out it doesn't work like that because it, it's not very good at causing thrombosis, which may be a good thing because clots can cause stroke. So what happens is, is that the coils are just like they sound, just like it sounds. They're, they look like little slinkies, and they come in different diameters, different shapes, different lengths, so that you fit them in the aneurysm, and it's like filling a balloon with string, and you keep putting in one coil after the next. I have another question. What is the, what is the cost difference between clipping versus coiling? Well, Dr. Larson did show a slide uh, regarding that, both in terms of ruptured and, and unruptured aneurysms. And it does, most of the data will suggest that, at first, clipping is more expensive because it requires typically a longer hospital stay. Over time, and Ted, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but over time, actually, that, that, that neutralizes out because coiling patients typically have to have multiple follow-up studies, as well as the tremendous anxiety of knowing that they may not have a fixed aneurysm. Um, through that, just... <laughs> you know, just to follow up on that, as I mentioned, this is one of the Achilles heels of endovascular treatment of cerebral aneurysms. We need better technology. And so we need to get to a point, and we're going to get there, where we can go in and we can treat an aneurysm with one device in less than an hour that completely cures it, that never comes back. And we're all working on this. There are all kinds of research devices out there. These are, this is just the infancy of endovascular treatment. And one of the things that Ted has talked to me about is the idea of possibly putting a small pumpkin seed inside, inside the aneurysm. That would swell. That would swell. I have one more. Okay, last question. My question is, is the mechanism of re-bleeding the same for coiling versus clipping? Is it a um, possible incomplete coiling versus not really fully clipping something? Or is there an erosion involved? Or is there bleeding from somewhere else? What's, what's the mechanism of re-bleeding? Any aneurysm that is incompletely endovascularly coiled is a concern. And that's why we do these follow-up studies. For me personally, if I can retreat an aneurysm, I want to retreat it because I never want to see that aneurysm bleed again or bleed for the first time. So your question is, if we put coils in an aneurysm, are we changing the natural history of the aneurysm? And I think Dr. Mason showed this, that I don't believe we're changing the natural history if the aneurysm is suboptimally treated with coils. It has to be as close or at 100% treated endovascularly to know that it's not going to bleed or enlarge. Did that answer your question? Symptomatic, are you finding it on post-operative So we do routine studies at six months, 18 months, sometimes three years, sometimes five years. If we see an aneurysm, typically we do two angiograms to follow up. If it's completely treated at 18 months, we don't follow it again. And I think that clipping, because it inherently has more trauma associated with it, it's less likely the aneurysm is going to re-bleed, although very frequently it is permanently excluded, 100%. But if there's a neck left on the aneurysm, I mean, obviously in my practice, I see those patients come back years later with growth of the aneurysm or a new subarachnoid hemorrhage. But it's far less common after clipping than it is with coiling. And I think one other thing, just to, to, to be entirely clear on that, is that if an aneurysm rebleeds, be it with coiling or with clipping, it can be a catastrophic life-ending event, and about 50% of those patients will die. And so that's the challenge with endovascular treatment when I'm talking to patients, that, you know, is this, I say it in jest, but it's actually not really. Do you really want to create a chronic disease, or do you kind of want to take all your risk up front and get it over with? Okay. Any other comments? Thank you.